today, as I've been doing, I will continue to um, teach about the collect of the Mass. In this Mass today, the opening prayer, or the collect of the Mass, sets the tone for everything else that we're doing. And in this collect, it tells us something that's pretty amazing. It's a prayer that uh, we should uh, be able to live completely without having to ask. And that is what I find so amazing. The amazing thing is we are stupid and that we just don't get what we should be getting even when it's the bare basics of our faith. And you will see what I mean shortly. The Collect of the Mass, once again, let me uh, pray it for you. O God, who makest the faithful to be of one mind and will, grant to thy people the grace to love what thou dost command and to desire what thou dost promise that amid the changes of the world our hearts may there be fixed where true joys are to be found. Now, to begin with, that first part of the prayer, O God who make us the faithful to be of one mind and one will, it does not mean that he makes us to be of one mind and will by forcing us. We are not his robots. He does not program us and say, you must obey. He makes us to be one mind and one will by making us, creating us in his image and likeness. He gives us each our own personality that is in such a way led to him. We are to have from the very depths of our soul a longing to be with him, and that is where we are going to become one in mind uh, and one in will with doing what he wants. We should know this already. This is absolutely the most uh, basic of our faith, that God wills us to be saints, that God wills us to do what he commands us, that God wills us to be of the same mindset as he is. And yet, in our stupidity, we think we can do better than God. We do not want him actually telling us what to do, giving us graces to follow through on what he tells us to do. We want to do it all on our own. And when we can't do something on our own, we blame him for what we are failing to do. We strive so much to do everything on our own that we want to, instead of following his will, tell him to follow ours. We make up our mind and then tell him to make up his mind that what we're doing is proper. This is our stupidity. We have no problem at all saying to God, I do not want to obey but I want you to obey me. And we will rationalize the very hell out of that statement by saying this is not anything that goes against what God wills. He wills me to be happy, and I'm telling you this will make, make me happy, God, so therefore you must will it as well. How silly we are. As we continue, now we're asking that God would make us one of mind and will, and oftentimes people then get the idea that all Catholics must think alike. If our minds are all of the same uh, set, uh, uh, point set, if we are all thinking like God, then we would all, once again, be in lockstep with each other. Well, that is absolute nonsense, for God gave us each a different personality. God gave us each different graces, and each one of us has what is called prudential judgment. If God says, this is what I want you to do, I want you to run a race, there are going to be some people who are going to say, Lord, I am happy to do that because you gave me the ability to run very quickly, and so I will run very quickly. Others will say, Lord, you did not give me the grace to run very quickly, so I'm going to run the race, but I'm going to do it at a slower pace because if I try to run as fast as the guy next to me, I am going to poop out before I even get halfway done, so I'm going to pace myself. This is the way it is with growing in holiness. There are people who are going to be able to disagree with you as to how they grow in holiness because God gave each one of us different ways of thinking about things, of actually doing things. Some of us can run directly and are very bold in whatever he says, and others kind of skirt around the outsides looking for just an opportunity to get in there and do what we needed to do without uh, much boldness at all, not quite being timid, but looking for a better opportunity than just running in like a bull in a china uh, shop. You all know people of different types of personalities do not ever think that all Catholics must be of the same uh, personality type and mindset. We have ability to disagree with each other on different things. 
So if you are mad at your brother, your sister, your mother, your father, your next door neighbor, your boss, whoever it is, because they're not Catholic the way you think they should be Catholic, because you're Catholic the way that God would want everybody to be Catholic, don't get mad at them if they are Catholic, if they are doing God's will, even if it's looking different than how you are doing God's will. Now, I'm not talking about allowing sin. I'm talking about striving for holiness in various and many ways. This is what we're acknowledging right off the bat. After that acknowledgement is made, knowing that we are all different, but we want to be of the same mind and will as God, now we start asking for things. So we ask, grant that thy people, uh, oh, grant to thy people the grace to love what thou dost command. And I'll stop right there, halfway through a sentence, because we have to acknowledge that we are his people. That is something absolutely essential. Too often we want to imagine that we're not really his people, we're our own people. But from the time you were baptized, you were adopted by God the Father as an adopted son or daughter. You are not a daughter or son the way that Jesus is the son of God, the only begotten. No, he adopted you into his family and you are now his. You are marked with an indelible mark at the time of your baptism that says who you belong to. And we must recognize that if we belong to God, we must do what God wants us to do. Even our Lord himself, who is the only begotten son of God the Father, did not exactly find it joyful to uh, look to the passion. Remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was sweating blood and he asked, let this, if, if it be your will, let it be, let this chalice pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. It's okay to be sweating blood as you're looking at what God has asked you to do, but always to be able to say, I will do your will, God, in order to accomplish this. Why? Because I'm yours. You are the one who has adopted me. Of course, I'm going to respond to a father's love. A son or a daughter does what the father asks, even if it's difficult. Why? Because this is the perfect father, and he knows exactly what we can do, what we need to do, what we should do, what we're capable of doing, and we have to ask him for the graces to do what we think we are not capable of doing. It really is that simple. You're my father. I will do what you ask. Now, give me the grace to do so. Grant to thy people the grace to love what thou dost command. So now we're his sons and his daughters, and he is commanding us to do something, just like your father commands you to do things at home. Those of you who are young, you know when your father says, go cut the grass, what does he want you to do? Does go cut the grass mean to go play video games for another hour? No, it means go cut the grass. This is what God is asking us to do. We want to be of one mind with him so that we will do what he asks. He's not asking us to do something that is bad. He's asking us to do something good, even if we don't want to do it. And so he commands us to do things, and we're asking that we would love what it is he commands. Now, for you young ones, I want you to imagine this. And for you old ones, I want you to imagine back in the history days, what was it like when your dad said, go cut the grass? Where you say, oh, I love that command. Thank you so very much. That's the greatest thing in the whole wide world you could possibly ask me to do. Probably not. This is something that we have to get over. We are going to be asked by God to do things that we are not exactly thrilled about doing, but we have to love doing it anyway. Can you love something that you're not thrilled about doing? Yes, you can. Our Lord loved being on the cross, nailed to that cross, offering his life for our salvation. In fact, we say that he loved us to death. We are to love doing the Father's will, even when it is extremely painful. We are to do that, whatever he wants. We are to love what he commands. We must know what he commands. What does he command? Well, the simplest, uh, most basic explanation of that is the Ten Commandments. And even that you would think we would be able to get by now because we are so smart and wonderful and holy, we would understand completely how we can love the Ten Commandments, but oftentimes... We only love certain of the commandments. We love them all in theory, but not when it comes down to practicality. So for right now, I love the first commandment. I am the Lord your God. You shall have no false gods before me. 
I, I'm good with you right now, Lord. No problem at all. There is nothing that is more important to you in this whole wide world. Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. Oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. You don't understand here. I grew up in a household where everybody, including my mother and little sister, swore like sailors. Of course I'm going to take your name in vain. I don't want that commandment put over here. I love the other commandments, but that one, nine out of ten isn't too, so bad. And then we can go through all of them at different times in our life that we say, I love all but this or these sets of commandments. We have to come to the point where we love the commandments. Why in the world would God tell us not to take his name in vain? Well, it's pretty simple because he's God and we're, we should be loving him and we don't use the, the Lord's name because we love him in vain. And yet we make excuses not to stick up for God where we would for our own mother. We're asked to love what he commands. He commands us to love God with our whole heart, mind, and soul and love our neighbor as ourselves. But I, okay, I've gotten to the point where I love God. I'm not sure if it's whole heart, mind, and soul, but it's the best that I can give, so that must be good enough. But love my neighbor as myself. I don't like my neighbor. My neighbor doesn't like me. How can I love my neighbor who doesn't like me? I'll tell you what, Lord, I want you to just close your eyes on this commandment and not, not even tell me about this one. I'm going to pretend it doesn't exist because my neighbor is so mean, rotten, and nasty. Of course I have to be mean, rotten, and nasty back to my neighbor. I can't possibly love somebody who's unlovable. And yet our Lord is looking at you and saying, you too are unlovable, and yet I love you, and I give you the grace to be lovable, and I give you this commandment, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, Lord, I'll love my neighbors myself, but that means I can't love myself very much. So I don't like myself too much, and now I can, I've justified not liking my neighbor all too much either. No, you have to love, and this is the hard commandment. As we're going through what the commandments are, what other things does he command? We are to return a blessing for a curse if somebody curses us. Mm, but that neighbor is cursing me all the time. Yes, return a blessing for the curse. You have to love your neighbor in order not to curse them back, but to bless them, to pray for them, to ask God to convert their heart if that's what's really necessary, to learn how to get along with them even when you think you can't. Does it take extra grace? Yes, yeah, sometimes supernatural grace. So ask for it. That's what we're praying for right now. There's so many other things in there that he asks us to, to do as commands, um, but I'm going to skip the rest of his commands. You get the idea. The next thing that we're asking for is that we would desire what he promises. Well, what is it that he promises? He promises eternal life, but there's a problem with eternal life. He does not promise that we will all get to heaven. He promises that there is a heaven, but he also promises that there is a hell. And eternal life is eternal life, whether you are in hell for eternity or in heaven for eternity. And we have to actually desire to understand that. People who do not, desire, who do not have that desire to understand are the ones who ignore hell completely. There is only a heaven and I'm going to go there. I don't know about you, but I know I'm going to go there. My neighbor that I don't like is probably not going to go there, but everybody else is going to go there. I truly do desire to get to heaven. But really, when I stop to think about it, I really don't have to desire it that much because I know there's no chance of me going to hell. So I just go through life as if it doesn't really matter whether I'm in heaven or hell because everyone's going to go to get to heaven. At least I am part of that. Everyone and my neighbor might not be, and I'll be happier if he's not. These are the kind of things we have to get over. We have to desire what it is that he promises. He promises, and he spoke more about this than heaven, he promises that there will be a hell that will be painful, that there will be flames that are there. You're going to be wailing and gnashing your teeth for all eternity. It's going to be a place of darkness, a place that was meant for the fallen angels. The demons will be there tormenting you for all eternity. That is a a promise of our Lord. We should desire to understand that so that we fear going to hell. No matter what happens, we will be holy so that we don't go there. That holy fear of disappointing God. I do not want to go against your will because I don't want to face punishment. 
An eternal punishment goes beyond anything I could possibly imagine. Therefore, I will avoid it at all costs. That is what we're asking for. And then once we get past that, that first stage of it, I don't want to go to hell. Now we can more easily go to the second stage. I want to be holy and get to heaven because I love you and you love me. You love me first and you're showing me how much you, you love me and I must try strive with all I can to love you that much in return. And I want to be there loving you that much in heaven, so therefore I'm going to strive with all I, can, I am to understand what heaven is, so I desire it even more. You promised it, and I want it. But that's only eternal life. We have to get through this life before we get to eternal life. What has he promised here? He promised that we will be blessed. If you remember the Beatitudes, you will be blessed when you are meek. You will be blessed when you are sorrowful. You will be blessed when things are going bad for you in every which way, shape, and form, including when they persecute you on, his, on account of his name, and you are facing even death. You are going to be blessed. Oh, I think you've gone too far now, Father. You can't really expect us to believe that. Don't believe me. Believe our Lord. He's the one that gave us the Beatitudes. You should desire these blessings. How could you possibly desire to be blessed in such a way that the world hates? A world says this is horrible things, and if God does this to you, he's mean, rotten, and nasty himself, and you don't have to pay any attention to him. And yet Jesus said, no, this is the blessing. You are going to be blessed when these things happen to you. Why? Because it's going to try your faith. And you're going to find out whether you really do have faith or not. It's going to be seeing whether you truly do love a sacrificial love or if you only love Jesus as if he's Santa Claus, and only when things are going well and you're getting gifts, do you pay any attention to him whatsoever. We are to understand this is a promise. They have persecuted me, and they have hated me. They will hate you. He told that to us directly. We should love being hated by those who hate Jesus Christ. And yet we don't want to do that. Our fallen human nature wants us to run away. This is why we have to pray for it because it is very difficult to love being hated by those who hate our Lord. It is it's hard to be hated by anybody, but we must pray for this grace. And then once we prayed that we would desire this, uh, what he promises, we're taking a look at how it is in the changes of this world that our hearts may be fixed where true joys are to be found. Where is true joy to be found? I've already told you, our Lord was filled with true joy in doing his Father's will. He was on the cross offering his life for you. He had already been whipped. He had already been crowned with thorns. He had already been uh, mistreated in every which way you could possibly think. And he was filled with joy. Not a joy that had him whistling as if it didn't hurt. No, it was a joy that says, I am doing my Father's will, and as horrible as this is, as evil as this is, my Father will bring, bring the greatest good out of it ever. Beyond anybody's imagination, you will be saved by what I'm doing. I am filled with joy. This is what should fill you with joy, doing the Father's will. Whatever he asks you to do, can you embrace a cross? Not take it grudgingly, not have to have people force it on you. Can you embrace a cross, desire to have a cross even, and ask for the ability to love your cross? Can you see how if God could bring out of that the destruction of his own son, if he could bring blasphemy beyond anything we could ever imagine doing, if he could bring about through his own death your salvation, don't you see how he wants you to join with him? And you can find true joy in doing so. Is it hard to follow his commandments? Yes, it is. Is it hard to pick up a cross? Yes, it is. Is it hard to beg for persecution and rejoice when you have it? Absolutely. This is why he gave us a church, to be brought into the church, into his family through baptism. I already mentioned we asked for that, acknowledged it in the beginning. But once we're here, we need to understand he gives us every grace we need, natural graces and supernatural graces, to do what we're praying for here. Look for those graces. You can indeed become a saint, but you must recognize how to do it. 
by desiring what he commands, by loving what it is that he promises, and by being willing to find the absolute joy, not the joys, the fleeting joys of the world, but the joys that go from this world to the next. We should love the things of this world only to the extent they make us holy, and we should reject them to the extent they take us away from our Lord. We pray for it today because we're too stupid to realize we should be living it every day of our life. May our Lord hear these prayers and bring a little common sense to us as we strive to become saints. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.